Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Peter Shields of Siemens EDA. We're going to talk today about Efficient Trace in RISC-V. So, Peter, as we look at RISC-V, a lot of these are, are completely different designs. They're still based on the same ISA, but they're, they're uh, one-off type of designs where people are doing something very unique with these designs and trying to customize it. What are some of the problems that you're seeing in terms of uh, how they behave out in the marketplace? I guess one of the main things that we're seeing is that uh, a lot of designs are not just RISC-V. So you're seeing RISC-V and ARM, um, DSP. So there's a whole mixture of different processes on, on, on these embedded SOCs. The tradition is, is that people have had the ability to, they had all the tools with these traditional uh, architectures, but RISC-V is relatively new. And so there's a little bit of apprehension about uh, about picking up and adopting RISC-V when perhaps the ecosystem isn't, isn't there fully mature, you know, in terms of uh, not just compilers, but also debug and trace. So let's dig into this. Sure. Peter, what are we looking at? So what we have here is, is I guess, the reason why uh, people need to trace. And the main reason is that understanding program behavior in complex systems is a big challenge. It's often very impractical to, to halt the core to debug the software. Uh, and that's especially true in, in real-time systems where the, the nature of those systems do not wait when the core is halted. So what's required is a, is a non-intrusive method of observing program behavior at full speed. Um, and that's something that enla en enables you to see exactly how the program executes within the system and how it's responding to those kind of real-time system events. And that's what Processor Trace is. Processor Trace provides you with that ability to, uh, to capture the sequence of executed instructions uh, at full speed without halting the core. And it, applied, it also then provides uh, additional uses such as forensic debugging, so enabling you to look back in time um, to root cause the, the problem that led up to the, to the issue um, for code profiling so that um, certain parts of the code can be, can be monitored and um, to see how um, to see how well they're executing and to, to see how much uh, time certain part, parts of the code are taking to execute. And obviously, it also be used for code coverage, so we can see which parts of the code have been executed, so we can improve our testing. Um, and Heisenberg. So Heisenbergs are the types of bugs that disappear when attempts are made to study them. Um, those are typically due to sort of invasive debugging techniques, such as uh, code instrumentation or printf statements, where they make subtle changes to the, uh, the execution of the code, which result in the bug disappearing. And so process trace is non-intrusive, uh, and it means that those kind of bugs can be monitored. I was just gonna say, and then the final one is, is, is kind of infrequent or random bugs, where it can maybe take uh, hours or even days before the, 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 the bug uh, shows itself. And so having the ability to record the sequence of events in maybe in a, in a circular buffer um, that allow you to look back and see what caused those, those problems is, is very valuable. And just to be clear, the trace that we're talking about is part of a RISC-V international spec, right? That just came out? Right, right, exactly. There's been a, a task group within RISC-V that's been working um, to define a, a standard um, and it's actually now into its its, uh, its second revision, which was uh, ratified earlier this year. When you talk about trace, what exactly are we looking at? Well, yeah, let me let me go into a little bit more detail about what trace really is. So trace is uh, it's a debugging technique where uh, executed processor instructions are are compressed on chip and then transmitted to to the host, which is the debugger where it can then reconstruct that program execution sometime later, typically off off offline. So the, the compression is, is kind of referred to as encoding and the, the, uh, the decoding of, the, of those instructions, um, it, it, again, it's done on the host. You know, one way of doing that is just transmitting every single instruction, but that would result in unmanageable volumes of, of, of data. And the RISC-V standard uh, employs what's known as process of branch trace, where only branches or deltas in the program code are reported. And that re results in, um, in very high compression. Um, and as, as we said earlier, the, um, the actual name of, the, of this, uh, this RISC-V standard is known as efficient trace for RISC-V. Now that efficiency really means that two things. You can, you can trace more, so you may have 
want to trace multiple uh, cores uh, simultaneously, or you may want to trace more data, so looking back further in time. But it also allows you to avoid trace loss. So there may be peaks in the, in the trace bandwidth, which are higher than the, uh, the capability of, of, of the SOC's interface to transmit. So, so higher bandwidth than, than, than the chip can, can transmit off chip. And in those circumstances, you lose trace. And so you, you don't know what happened. So efficiency is important to make sure that we don't result in, in losing trace. And the, and the standard itself, it, it, has, um, it has some additional um, optional modes, which can even take that, um, that compression even higher. And it also includes um, an optional for, for data trace. So we can actually capture both uh, the data and addresses of, of load and store operations as well. One of the interesting things about this trace specification is that it allows you to step back and look at how things are behaving. And so what you're talking about with these Heisenbugs, obviously based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is that you don't necessarily know where they crop up, where they're going, what series of actions produce that result that you, you don't want, right? Is, is that the way this is all working? Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the fact that it's non-intrusive, so it's monitoring, you can configure it to monitor all the time, and you can feed that into a, into a, into a buffer, so you've got a, a capture of what has been executing, so that when a bug is discovered or the system deadlocks, you can say, okay, well now I can just look at that data, I can reassemble and, and see what the program execution was um, that led up to that event without actually interfering with the execution of, of the code on, 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 the, on the SOC. How does this actually work? I mean, what are you actually looking at? If you're an engineer working on a RISC-V chip, what are you doing here? Yeah, so basically you need to embed um, some IP that will uh, generate this, this trace for you. And, um, and the way it does that is, um, is, is by reporting the, uh, the branches as, as the code executes. So the first thing it would do is it would report the start address. And from that point onward, it would only report the branches. And branches can be uh, jumps, calls, returns, interrupts, and exceptions. And then all the uh, instructions that uh, execute sequentially in between those branches they don't need to be reported. So that, that saves a huge amount of, of trace bandwidth. So then it's really only important that it, the, the encoder, the IP in the chip, reports whether the branches are taken or not. There are also indirect jumps um, and interrupts and exceptions. The standard refers, these, refers to these as uh, uninferable program counter discontinuities. Quite a mouthful. But what that means is, when it's not possible for the, uh, the destination of jump to be determined by just looking at the code alone, we need to therefore report the, uh, the, the destination as well. And so the, the, the encoder must, must uh, report that within, um, within its algorithm. And here's a little example. So if we're looking at a bit of code here, this is actually just a bit of code that uh, calculates a factorial. So the first thing is that the encoder would report the start address. Sequential instructions are then not reported, and then we encounter a branch. So the branch must either be reported as taken or not taken. And this, in, in this case, it's not taken, so we report it as such. Then there are some more sequential instructions. Again, they don't need to be reported. And then we hit another branch. In this case, it, uh, it does branch. It takes us back to the uh, instruction at address 14. So we execute those sequential instructions again. They don't need to be reported. And then finally, the last branch instruction, again, is not taken. So that little example, it only actually requires four you know, packets of data to be, to be transmitted. And as you can imagine, in much larger uh, sequences of code, it can be very much more efficient than that. And when you think about an ARM core, they've already done all this work for you, right? But in RISC-V, you have to actually do it yourself. Right, exactly. So, I think, so ARM, for example, have been um, providing this kind of capability within their cores for, uh, for many years. Um, RISC-V being new and the, the desire to, to create a much more efficient version of processor trace, a lot of the cores themselves, in fact, don't have uh, a, a, the trace capability. So that's where Siemens came along and we uh, created a, a trace encoder IP um, that was compatible with any RISC-V core that adheres to that standard and therefore can generate this, this trace in this, in this very efficient format. How does this work in the real world? Can you provide an example of how this actually is being done? 
Yeah, sure. In fact, um, so what I have here is some uh, descriptions of what the actual trace specification, the risk five specification describes. Um, so for the first thing it describes is the, the encoder interface. So this is the, the set of signals that must come out of the, the, the CPU core to interface to the, the encoder IP. And so there's a set of signals for instruction trace, and then there's a set of signals for data trace. It also in, uh, describes the various uh, trace modes. And basically, delta address mode is the only one that's mandatory. The specification then describes a set of um, additional uh, encoding algorithms that are even more efficient. And then it also describes the trace packets. So the packets are obviously containing the trace information to be transmitted off chip. And there are various different formats containing that information. There are also um, trace packets described for data trace um, and also compression schemes for data trace. Data trace is much harder to compress. There's a lot of data to be transmitted. So the standard defines various schemes that can uh, optimize and compress that, that data uh, to be transmitted off chip. And also another way of minimizing the amount of um, trace data is by using filtering. So specifically what to trace and when to trace. And as an example, you could say maybe trace um, a specified range of, of instruction addresses or uh, an address to start, an address to stop. Or you could trace um, privilege levels or a range of contexts, for example. And then finally, the standard um, describes timestamping. So timestamping um, such that when there are trace streams coming from multiple hearts, so multiple processor execution units, um, we can coordinate that data to understand how the, the code is executing in different parts of the system. So what you're doing here really is you're taking a look at how does this chip behave? Where are you seeing problems? And then drilling down into this uh, to follow the data path or whatever you're trying to do in terms of we can actually trace this all the way down to the problem and then fix it. Right, exactly. So once the problem has been identified, the trace should hopefully give us the clues to find out what caused that. What was the thing that led up to that problem? And then using traditional techniques, we may be able to make, maybe make some changes to the code or perhaps maybe change some variables, rerun and, and, and test our theories as to why or, or ways of, of, of fixing those problems. From a high level, what we're really seeing is the EDA community is now starting to move into the RISC-V world. It's a sort of a stamp of approval of this is going to be real, right? Right. You know, and um, so Ultrasoc um, was a startup company that had been operating for about 10 years or so and was acquired by Siemens um, coming up for two years now. And that was a, a big change, I think, to move not just in from EDA, but uh, in, into IP but also looking into the, uh, the debug and how code is executing on the SOC rather than just how the SOC is designed. And what we're looking at here is really the, the movement of RISC-V into more mission critical type of application. This opens a door to be able to say, okay, this will, this will work in a setting no matter what, right? Right, and, and as SOCs become faster and faster, um, there is a, there's ultimately a limit on, on performance that within the silicon. And so designers of systems, not just looking at optimizing the, the performance of the silicon, but they're also looking at optimizing the performance of the software. Where can I make competitive advantages by optimizing my entire system, including software and silicon, by, you know, by improving the performance of my system? And, and Trace also helps with that. So Trace will... Um, can show you, especially cycle accurate trace. So this is another uh, innovation that, um, that we, we've created on top of the standard, which allows you to identify how long every single instruction is executed. So you can get, you can get super high resolution on ways to optimize and improve the, uh, the performance of your code. Peter Shields, thanks for an interesting discussion. Okay, it's been great meeting you. Thank you.